Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Welcome to part 12 of my review of Masks of Nalathotep for Call of Cthulhu 7th edition by Chaosium. In this video I'll be covering part 1 of chapter 7, China. Due to it being quite large and involved, I will be breaking it down into three parts. Part 1 will encompass arriving in Shanghai and chasing down the leads that should ultimately lead them to Grey Dragon Island. This will include the Stumbling Tiger Bar and the Shanghai Courier. Part 2 will be the sidetrack scenario, the Demon Cabinet of Mr Lung, a gentleman of business where the investigators finally get to meet the diabolical Ho Fang, as well as the Dark Mistress and Shanghai Museum. Part 3 will be Madam Swallow, Mr Wu, New China, and the chapter, and perhaps the campaign finale, Grey Dragon Island. The chapter begins by informing us that Lovecraft never set a mythos story in China and gives a list of the other stories that are used as an influence here. It indicates that if China is the first place they go instead of London, then it will be pretty difficult, although the rewards they could yield are great with being able to finally meet Jack Brady and obtain a translation of the seven cryptical books of Hassan, with those two holding great importance in being able to stop Niall Athotep's evil plan. It indicates that most players either visit Shanghai at the beginning or the end of the campaign, and they face cultural and language barriers along the way. The chapter more often provides a conclusion to the campaign, though everything they've learned so far should put them in the best position to face Grey Dragon Island. It gives us an explanation of the naming conventions used throughout, saying that they follow the Wade Giles transcription system rather than the more modern and accurate pinyin system, as it more properly reflects the times, and it also makes the point that Chinese and Japanese names are written with the family name first, giving the example that it would be Do John instead of John Do. After this we move on to picking up the trail. It talks about all the different clues that can point the investigators in the way of China, mostly due to Jackson Elias' notes and contacts he made there. Brady has visited Hong Kong to look in on Roger Carlyle on a number of occasions, in the sanitarium he is committed to, but avoids the Yellow Lily Bar due to his previous meeting with Nails Nelson, and should the investigators wind up there, they will find nothing unless they explicitly know about Roger Carlyle, which is particularly difficult as he goes under the pseudonym Randolph Carter. They may well be aware of the Stumbling Tiger Bar due to the matchbox found in America. Another clue that points towards Brady being in Shanghai is the unfinished letter found in Misa House in England. Of course, Ho Fang imports are littered throughout the campaign, and one would imagine that would pique the interest of the investigators to find out who they are. If they went as far as entering the Bent Pyramid and viewing the map on the wall, then that would also point towards Shanghai. Even old Bundari and Kenya's spirit talks with the mystic Hassan should also point towards the Far East. We have a map of the Pearl of the Orient, Shanghai, which includes all of the relevant places in the chapter, though it is a bit cramped, and then it goes on to discuss the Carlisle expedition in China. Only two members of the expedition actually made it this far. Jack Brady and Sir Obi Penhew, who took over Grey Dragon Island in 1921. The island is the home of a fanatical cult of Deep Ones with a captive Shoggoth, and is the place where Penhew is assembling his rocket that he intends to burn the sky with. The first part of said rocket arrived in September 1921, and plans and parts have been steadily arriving from Australia and England ever since. Brady arrived around two years before Penhew after committing Carlisle, and had hoped to put things behind him, but seeing Penhew on his boat, the Dark Mistress, in 1921, made him realise that he couldn't sit idly by. He has been working with revolutionary militia and occult experts that he trusts in order to figure out the best way to stop Penhew when the day arrives. Elias arrived in Shanghai in September 1924, where he found Brady, who has subsequently told him what happened on the ill-fated Carlisle expedition, though the seven cryptical books of Hassan were not in his possession at the time. Niall Athotep's cultists, who had been chasing Elias since he left Nairobi, caught up with Elias here, where they began a barrage of attacks on his sanity, hence the reason his notes become more and more confused by the time he reaches America. We then go on to running the chapter. We have the usual London Underground map of where clues lead, and then it goes into advice on how things could potentially play out. It makes the point that there are a number of powerful enemies in Shanghai, with Grey Dragon Island presenting potentially the most dangerous in Penhu and his apocalyptic plans. There is only one sidetrack scenario in China, the Demon Cabinet of Mr Lung, which, while unrelated in the main scenario, can provide the investigators with some valuable information and potential direction. Due to the amount of potential enemies, it could become a bit of a bookkeeping nightmare having to remember who has crossed who or making sure the plot is not pushed either side of centre. It gives a number of pulp considerations and then moves on to arriving in China and Shanghai. It details the various routes that the investigators can take, showing the easiest way to get there from America, England, Egypt, Kenya and Australia, including the various licences and custom rules that need to be observed, making the point that firearms licences can be obtained for a small fee. After this we go into the actual setting information. 
It informs us that modern China was born accidentally, partly due to the collapse of the dynastic system and also due to the interference of imperial powers after the Great War. The Treaty of Versailles gifted Japan all of Germany's rights to the Shantung province. China's understanding of this was that due to them assisting the Allies in the war, these territories would revert back to them if victory came and it left the country insulted. This spared the creation of the May the 4th movement, which birthed the Chinese Communist Party, but also revivified Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist KMT party. Both became enemies whose wars paralysed China for over 50 years. In July 1926, Chiang Kai-shek officially launches their military arm, Northern Expedition, with the idea that it would get rid of local and regional warlords and unify central China with Canton and the South. It is successful and China takes Shanghai in 1927. Later that year, Chiang attacks the communist left leadership, executing many of them. One who barely manages to escape is Chu Enlai, a future premier of China. It goes into detail about the rise of Hong Kong, saying that it was originally a quiet backwater and that the British forces annexed it in 1841. The Treaty of Nanking ceded the island to the British in perpetuity. It flourished in the British rule thanks in part to its status as a free port and the colony grew steadily through the early 20th century, becoming a major financial centre like Shanghai. Shanghai itself was opened to trade in 1842 as part of the Treaty of Nanking, with the French, British and Americans taking certain areas as their own. These areas are known as the concessions. In 1954, three concessions formed the Shanghai Municipal Council, or SMC, to jointly oversee their affairs, and by 1863, the British and American concessions had joined forces to form the Shanghai International Settlement, with the French never formally amalgamated, preferring to see to its own affairs. Due to the terms of extraterritoriality, or extrality as it was known, citizens from these powers as well as other favoured treaty powers could only be tried under the laws of their native country, with Chinese citizens and those non-favoured such as Germany prosecuted under Chinese law. By the 1920s, Shanghai was known as the Pearl of the Orient and the Paris of the East in honour of its opulence and decadence. Legal tender as the Yuan from the late 1880s and also Mexican silver dollars were widely accepted. A single pound sterling is worth five dollars or ten yuan, with a dollar being worth two yuan. In Shanghai, there were in 1923 around 20,000 non-Chinese residents out of the 1.6 million population, which were mostly Japanese. Expatriates from America and Europe called themselves Shanghailanders. In the 1920s, China's economy is in ruin after the collapse of the Qing dynasty, and even moderately wealthy foreigners could live in opulence there, with millions of Chinese workers being paid almost nothing. Even the lowliest foreigner could afford servants. In the 1920s, the Chinese triads were on the rise, with over a hundred powerful groups in Shanghai alone. The city itself is built on the Yangtze River Delta, on almost flat land, and the weather is humid and warm with rainy seasons and cold winters. It is a low city with dikes and sea walls to protect against floods and tides, and the water table is very high, with difficult drainage making obtaining pure water troubling. The Bund, Shanghai's equivalent to Wall Street, has its own police force, the SMP, and volunteer force in times of civil unrest. The SMP has been infiltrated by the criminal Green Gang, detailed here. The concession has a thriving trade in opium after it was banned in 1918, with prostitution being banned two years later. The homes of the rich in Shanghai are replete with high stone walls, stout gates and barred windows, with an employ of watchmen and guards. Buildings in the city are usually no taller than three storeys, and it is riddled with long tang or tiny alleyways. The French concession has wide, tree-lined boulevards to remind the residents of Paris. It makes the point that some of the Shanghai locations in this chapter did exist in the 1920s, such as the Siemens Club and the Shanghai Museum, though some have been moved to suit the story. The current political climate here is one of rallies, roving mobs and fights between the police and workers. Getting around the city means ideally employing a guide or risking their very lives. Even more important should any of the investigators be a Chinese native. Fraternising with the locals is frowned upon and business is handled via middlemen. Language-wise, English is widely spoken and uniformed Chinese policemen are courteous and helpful within the international settlement. Local telegraph services are reliable and private couriers are cheap and quick. Outside of the settlement, investigators must speak Shanghainese or have an interpreter, though Mandarin or Cantonese will work with a hard language role. This is followed by a world map from 1925 showing the route of the Carlisle expedition and then we move on to Comparadors. These are essential middlemen for foreigners conducting financial business in China. They're crucial business mediators and could be as lowly as a guide or as powerful as a director of a foreign company. They have a tendency to be westernised, even down to their clothing, and usually receive a salary, expenses and commission on every sale or deal they make. 
It gives an example of one here, Li Wencheng. We then move back to the campaign itself with the cult in residence, the Order of the Bloated Woman. This particular mask of Nyarlathotep is that of a 600-pound tentacled female humanoid. The high priest of this order is Ho Fang, a wealthy importer in Shanghai, and the cult has around 300 members. They all have a tattoo of the cult characters in their left armpits, and their ceremonial robes are black and yellow silk. Their main weapon is the sickle, which is used quite gruesomely to sever the limbs of victims and then mutilate their bodies. It has links to a colony of deep ones in the East China Sea, and hybrids are common in the ranks. They have a bad reputation in the Shanghai criminal underworld. After that, we move on to the dramatis personae of the chapter. I will go into these people more when we reach their relevant section in the book, but here is a quick overview. Starting with allies and independents, we have Fergus McChum Chum, the bar owner of the Stumbling Tiger. He keeps his eyes open and himself to himself. He knows a lot, but has the common sense to keep quiet. He owes a debt to Jack Brady, who once saved his life in a barroom brawl, knowing that Brady does not want to be found and does not know his location, only that he is still in Shanghai. There is Isogei Taro, an undercover agent for the Imperial Japanese Navy, a powerful ally should the investigators manage to get him on side, who has infiltrated Shanghai. We have Anthony Chang, the editor of the Shanghai Courier, who can assist the investigators in their endeavours if they can get him to believe in their mission. We have Choi Mei Ling, a flower girl in the employ of Anti Gi and currently a tortured prisoner in Ho Fang's mansion. We have Lin Yan Yu, a wealthy and powerful woman who has skills in getting people to give up their secrets. She knows of the other of the bloated woman and wants no trouble from them, and although she is elderly, she has knowledge of the occult and mythos enough to protect herself. There's Mu Xian, a scholar who is currently translating the seven cryptical books of Hassan for Jack Brady in order for him to discover knowledge about the Eye of Light and Darkness. We have Chu Min a member of the revolutionary New China organisation, though firmly on the payroll of firm action. Jack Brady met him years ago and has since provided him with evidence of the Order's activity, gaining the pledge from firm action to help if it is needed. And finally we have Jack Brady himself, the last sane member of the Carlisle expedition, who hides out in Shanghai in order to learn the secret of the Eye of Light and Darkness and to take down the Order. We then move on to adversaries. First up is the despicable Ho Fang, a wealthy, successful businessman to all outward appearance, but the foul high priest of the Order of the Bloated Woman in secret. It gives us some information on how to handle Night of Chris in Shanghai, should she have been resurrected, and then we have Carl Stanford, an immortal sorcerer and fanatic. Originally portrayed in Shadows of Yog sothoth Stanford's appearance is meant to bring paranoia to the investigators. He is extremely dangerous and best avoided. There is Captain Jules Savillard, a cultist who pilots Sir Robbie Pentheu's yacht, the Dark Mistress, who is suffering from radiation poisoning. And finally we have Sir Aubrey Penhew himself, a peer of the realm and powerful sorcerer who plays a crucial part in the opening of the Great Gate. OK, so first up is the Stumbling Tiger Bar. This should be known to the investigators due to the matchbox found in Jackson Elias' hotel room in New York, but can also be found out from Anthony Chang at the Shanghai Courier. Northeast of the confluence of the Wangpu and Suchow rivers, there is a district of bars, gambling dens, and flower girl houses. This is detailed here. These are essentially, for the most part, prostitution that combines entertainment. And at 10 Lantern Street is the Stumbling Tiger Bar. It has Chinese and English signs that show a drunken tiger stumbling over a rock. Jackson Elias met Jack Brady here, and it was the secrets he learned that eventually led to his undoing. It is a single room with a separate toilet. It is dark, dirty, and covered in posters of Chinese singers and film stars. It has a heavy, damp quality and has patrons inside. Behind the bar is Fergus McChum Chum. If the investigators are honest and ask for a meeting and produce evidence or even share everything they know about Jackson Elias' murder, then he will confide in them, though actually getting him to talk won't be easy as he knows he is risking his life. He can tell them about Jack Brady, believing him to no longer be in Shanghai but in Rangoon, meeting someone called Charlie Gray. This is of course a lie, but pretty convincing, though we actually suspect he is in Shanghai. If asked about Ho Fang, he can tell him that he does not want to come to his attention. He knows he leads the order of the bloated woman here, and that he is a very dangerous man. He can tell him that his house is located in the French concession, and it is like a fortress. He can tell him about Grey Dragon Island, saying that it is a dormant volcano cone, and that junk sail over there every few weeks. Strange things are said to happen, and fishermen avoid it. Ho Fang's private yacht, the luxuriant goddess, regularly visits there. He can tell him about the Dark Mistress, Sir Robbie Penhew's steam yacht. It arrives in Shanghai occasionally to take in supplies, and Chum suspects it is cultist-led and arrives from Grey Dragon Island. If he is asked about Jackson Elias, he can't give much information, as he didn't have much contact with him. 
It gives some information on what the Keeper should do if the investigators get sidetracked with Chum's story regarding Charles Grey. There is indeed a company in Rangoon called Charles Grey Limited, and he is a friend of Brady who was covering for him should anybody hunt him down. Chum meeting with the investigators may pique the interest of his Soge Taro, the agent of Lin Yan Yu, or Ho Fang, and his life is essentially in the hands of the investigators. The Order knows he sells information, but are unaware of his connections to Brady. The next section is called The Drunken Foreman. Here it goes into Isoge Taro. He is in the bar dressed as a Japanese foreman and acting drunk though is found out with the right skills, with it being noticed that he spills more than he drinks. If the investigators see through his disguise and he is convinced of their trustworthiness, he will reveal himself to them after watching them for a while. He can tell the investigators that he believes that Jack Brady is involved in shady dealings and he is staking out the stumbling tiger in order to track him down. He is aware of his connection to a fanatic militia and knows where they train. He has identified Xu Min as being the leader of the group, though he doesn't know its name. He knows nothing of the order, though fears a new weapon is being assembled to use against the Chinese government or foreign powers. It then moves on to the agent of Madame Lin. They've been searching the city for Jack Brady and keep a watch on the bar in case he goes there or they hear of anybody asking about him. They will also follow the investigators, though can be spotted with the right roles. They will ransack their rooms at the first opportunity, taking anything they think their mistress would be interested in. In return, they can also be followed back to Lin's Shanghai headquarters. If the investigators come to the attention of Ho Fang, he'll have them trailed or killed if he has information that they're potentially dangerous. Any investigator captured will be kept on the Dark Mistress or at his mansion. The next section is the Shanghai Courier. They can find out about this from Nigel Wasif in Cairo, though it is a pretty easy choice when looking for local information. It is a daily production that is in both English and Chinese, and has a reputation for accurate reporting. The editor is Anthony Chang, who is happy to listen to or speak to the investigators, and will react positively to the recommendation of Nigel Wasif. He can tell them about the current political situation in Shanghai, with private militia popping up all over the city, corruption being rife, and criminal gangs profiteering. He has heard rumours about the Order of the Bloated Woman, but he believes it is just a criminal gang boosting their reputation, and has not seen any tangible evidence of its existence. If Lin Yan Yu is mentioned, he can tell them about her hedonistic eccentric lifestyle and also about how smart and shrewd she is and about her being a collector of antiquities with her home said to resemble a small museum. He can also point them towards Mr Mao at Shanghai Museum. The investigators can also search the courier's archives, which takes around a day. There are four articles of recent age that catch their eyes. They all suggest the work of a monster. The first three are leads that could take them to Jack Brady and the fourth is a sidetrack scenario. The first happened six weeks before their arrival and involved the Siemens Club being damaged on its riverside. The second was four weeks before they arrived and was about three monks being found dead in a pavilion fire at the Garden of the Purple Clouds of Autumn with eyewitnesses saying that the fire moved in an uncanny fashion following the monks in a cloud with a European scene leaving the vicinity. The third happened two days before they arrived and involved the murder of a flower girl called Reparita Wong and a Mr Chin Si Chu being brutally murdered with a witness describing a giant bat at the scene. And the fourth being on the day they arrived. Upon first glance it looks mythos related but it's just a coincidence. They will also find another article dated around six months previous which gives an account of a huge wave washing over a trawler near Grey Dragon Island with the only survivor saying that it struck without warning on a calm day. First up is the Siemens Club. If they visit it they will find a damaged building and locals will mention seeing creatures that look like walking fish that caused it to collapse. A local, Wang Young, will swear blind that this is a fact. If the staff are questioned, the investigators can discover that an American, John Smith, was staying in the room directly facing the shattered wall. This was, of course, Jack Brady. The second one took place on Chinling Road. Tracking down a witness from the article, a Mr Liu Chen Dai, will confirm what the bonds or Buddhist priest had to say. However, to avoid ridicule, he has changed his story and now thinks it was a trick of the light. The third one leads them to a flower girl house. One of these girls, Quivering Jade, will tell them that the girl who lived in the room previous to the person who was murdered was sold to another house and kept an American in her room, knowing him only as John, though will confirm it as Jack Brady has shown a photo. The girl who was sold was called Choi Mei Ling. The mother of the house, a haggard looking woman called Auntie Gee, will eventually speak to the investigators for the correct recompense and will show them the murder room splattered with blood and wrecked. The fourth article leads to the only sidetrack adventure. Okay, that concludes part one of the China chapter. The next part will cover the demon cabinet of Mr Lung, a gentleman of business, the dark mistress and Shanghai Museum.